Okay, thank you. It's uh, very nice to be here. I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about a plant that I've spent a career working on, Spartina alterniflora. This is the uh, this is what an East Coast salt marsh looks like, and this is Spartina alterniflora. This is this plant is treasured on the East Coast, and there there are laws protecting this kind of habitat. Now on the West Coast, there's a war going on against this species, and it's it's always been I, I've always been curious. How is it that on the East Coast this, this plant is so valuable and on the West Coast it's, it's regarded as a dangerous alien invader? Um, I, I want to go on record as saying that I, I think it is good policy to prevent invasions. There are plenty of examples of troublesome and even harmful invasive species. We teach this in classes. That said, once an invasion occurs, you have to use the best science, you have to use some common sense, and you have to do a cost-benefit analysis to determine whether the cost of control is worth it or not. Some invasive species are actually beneficial. This is one of them. So you have to look at the environmental costs of control and the, envir and the economic costs and benefits. There are, there are both. Now, um, as earlier speakers have said, um, many invasive species are not nearly as problematic as they're made out to be. David talk, talked about the purple loose strife here. Uh, there's, this has been the poster child of uh, invasive species in wetlands all across North America, and yet there's really no evidence that this plant has actually caused any, any real problems. Um, evidence is mounting that introductions, introductions are often benign or even beneficial. Uh, this prickly pear, which invades Mediterranean ecosystems, benefits native plants by attracting pollinators. Um, and you can find a lot of evidence like this now of, uh, of benefits. Rarely is any single species all bad or all good. You can, you can in any invasive species, you can find, you can find benefits and you, you can probably find problems too. You have to, and you have to weigh this very carefully against the cost of control. Um, Take the case of this Spartina alterniflora, this salt marsh grass that I've worked on. Uh, paradoxically, this is estimated to provide high-value high ecosystem services on the East Coast, but on the West Coast it's regarded as a pest. Now, interestingly, I should add that the Spartina on the West Coast was introduced uh, around the turn of the century by oyster fishermen who were trying to introduce the East Coast oyster to the West Coast. And they ship the, the oysters out here packed in crates in Spartina grass. Well, the East Coast oyster didn't do well here, so they went and found oysters from Asia, uh, the, the uh, Japonica. And so that, now that's what you have in your, in your estuaries here now. You have the, the Pacific oyster, which um, is um, <coughs> Part of the problem, I think, I think the, uh, a lot of the pressure for eliminating the Spartina is actually coming from the oyster industry, but that's another story. This Spartina, uh, you can actually, uh, it's, it's fashionable now to per try and put an economic value on different kinds of ecosystems, ecosystem services. And this particular plant and, and salt marshes provides some protection from from storms, the, the, the grasses knock down the amplitudes of storm surges as they come ashore protecting uh, infrastructure. Uh, they, they act like wastewater treatment plants. Uh, they're fantastic at removing nutrients from water and, and sediments. And so they perform the function of a tertiary treatment plant. They are a refugia and habitat for uh, fish and shrimp. Uh, they produce food. Uh, for marine resources, uh, they pr produce um, raw materials, and they are, they are areas that are valued for recreation. All of these 
All of these benefits, you can put a dollar uh, figure on, and, the, um, and it's been estimated that these ecosystems have a value of about $14,000 per hectare, or, or nearly $6,000 per acre. Now, once carbon cap and trade kicks in, the value of these systems really goes up because they also sequester a lot of carbon. They take up CO2 from the atmosphere and they bury it in the soil. That's worth about $18,000 an acre. So these are pretty, pretty valuable ecosystems. Not all ecosystems have the same values. E eelgrass ecosystems have very high values. This is a table here of different economic values of different systems. Salt marshes, 4,300. Uh, Mudflat, 800, and so on. I think there's a little bit of, I, this, um, I, this is one aspect of valuing e ecosystems that, that troubles me a little bit because this gets, this gets, its, gets, its, gets us into the, the area of, well, my ecosystem is more valuable than your ecosystem. And I don't think that's a, a very healthy place to, to go, but nevertheless. So the, the agencies here in California have decided to get rid of this plant, and there is a West Coast Governor's Action Plan that has some very interesting information in it. This is a map here on the left of where these uh, invasions are established, and those are the different Spartina species there on the left. Anglica there is from Europe, Patens is from the East Coast, Densiflora is from South America, Alterniflora from the East Coast, and then there are um, a lot of hybrids. And so you can see how they're distributed. Now these figures here are from this action plan. And the figures are totally misleading. And I'd love to know who drew, drew these things. The figure on the top shows a cross section of what one of your marshes is supposed to look like. And these are, this is high marsh vegetation here. This is the level of, of the mean high, high water in your estuaries. Here's mean, mean, mean low, low water down here. And notice where the eelgrass is plotted in this figure. Um, somewhere around mean sea level or, or above. So eelgrass does not grow there. Eelgrass grows at a lower elevation. Now this is, the, the, the bottom figure is the, an artist's rendition of what the marshes are going to look like after the, the evil invader, Spartina comes in and you'll notice that um, the Spartina grasses now have, have taken over this entire zone right up to the edge of a, of a, a sheer cliff that just drops off into deep water like there's a canyon there and there is no eelgrass. The Spartina has completely eliminated the eelgrass and that is total fiction. That is not what's going to happen. Uh, first of all, Spartina and eelgrass do not share the same habitat. This is uh, the, the figure on the left. This is fr uh, data from a friend of mine who's out here. Um, Ripsic, and this is the distribution of the eelgrass with, uh, as, it, as, it's, uh, as a function of the elevation relative to mean sea level. So here's mean sea level here, and this is the eelgrass growing at an elevation below mean sea level and peaking somewhere around mean low, low water. So this is a really deep, uh, um, this is a plant that grows, you know, pretty far down in the intertidal zone. Here's Spartina over here, Spartina. Here's mean sea level here, and this is mean high water is up here somewhere. So Spart Spartina is a, uh, grows in the upper half of the intertidal zone, not the lower half. So first of all, that's a big fiction that the Spartina is going to eliminate the eelgrass. So here is my take on, on what's really going to look like. So this is the governor's figure of the way things are today, except that uh -uh, this does not grow here, sorry. Um, F, and, and this is there uh, after, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. What's probably going to happen is something closer to this. The, the Spartina is going to take over uh, some of this mudflat area. There's still going to be plenty of eelgrass around. The, there's still going to be mud flat. The thing that's not that's a little misleading here is there's there's, there's going to be considerable mud flat still. Um, we can look at we can look for the uh, at the European experience to get a to, to make some predictions about what's going to happen. 
Spartina, Spartina Anglica was introduced into Western Europe in the 1930s to stabilize sediments and harbors. And if this notion that they're going to completely take over the environment and eliminate shorebirds, eliminate oysters, mudflats, etc., if that was true, well, we would probably see that in Western Europe. So here's a marsh in, in Denmark where I've worked. And this is a Google image. This is a, uh, a dune barrier island here. Here's the Spartina Anglica that's established here. And here, look at all of that. What does that look like to you? That's mud flat, okay? Oyster, oyster habitat. A friend of mine, a Dutch friend of mine, uh, Spartina Anglica, was introduced in Dutch estuaries in the 1930s, and the historical aerial photographs document a rapid expansion of salt marsh area in the 1930s and 40s. Since then, there's been little new expansion, only locally on a much smaller scale. It is definitely not true that all mudflats converted into Spartina marshes. I roughly guess, guess that about 10 to 20 percent of the original mudflat area converted. That's a local expert. This also is from the governor's report, and they use language here like clones of hybrid Spartina look like bacteria in petri dishes. Ooh, God, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? And look at this. Oh, God, it looks like colonies of E. coli. And then over here, <laughs> here, invasive Spartina threatens to, to colonize thousands of acres of mudflats that are essential foraging habitat for millions of migratory residents, shorebirds, and waterfowl. You're going to lose your birds. <laughs> this is the marsh in Denmark where the Spartina <coughs> was, was, was planted in the 1930s. Those are birds, <laughs> and that's mud flat, and there's a new equilibrium that's been established between the vegetated area and the mud and the birds, and everything is happy, not a problem. So, um, I'll leave you with a few conclusions. In general, it is a good policy to prevent the introduction of alien species into new habitats. I agree with that. There are convincing examples of invasives that have become harmful pests. You know, the problem is we don't know. We can't predict. When, a, when an invader comes in, you just can't predict. Is it going to be good or is it, is it going to be bad? So, good policy. Try and keep them out. On the other hand, not all invasives are troublesome. Some are beneficial. And you have to weigh it on a case-by-case -case basis. Spartina... Uh, as a good example, will transform estuaries where it is introduced. It will transform estuaries, but there's no evidence of harmful impacts. To the contrary, this East Coast native provides high value ecosystem services. It is good policy to weigh the costs of control against the benefits of control. And the costs of control here on the West Coast will include the spraying of herbicides, uh, and they're using something called a mazapir right now, in perpetuity, because you will never get rid of this plant. You will always be in a control mode trying to knock its populations down with, with chemicals. And it seems to me that that's not a good idea, you know? So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> when you're talking about perpetuity, in Willapa Bay, they've been spraying Spartina with a, a, a mazapir, but also it started out with uh, glyphosate. And in 2003, they've been spraying for 20 years. They now have a cocktail of a mazapir and, and glyphosate.